Hello and welcome to the Two Time Loud Podcast. I'm Francis Wade and this is your first time listening. This is where I continue my search for breakthrough ideas in the area of time-based productivity. Most of my shows do include interviews with other people, with thought leaders and thinkers, while a few of them are actually just opportunities for me to share some of the very latest ideas that I've come across while researching ideas for my blog or my book. As you may know, the show has been on a hiatus. I took time away to complete the writing, editing, and publication of my book, Perfect Time-Based Productivity, a unique way to protect your peace of mind as time demands increase. The good news is that it's now available on Amazon.com or at my website at http colon slash slash perfect dot mytimedesign.com. My first guest, very first one since taking that pretty long break, is Bridget Schultz. She's the author of Overwhelmed, How to Work, Love and Play When No One Has the Time. And it's a book that's been particularly well received, actually named one of the Washington Post's 15 notable nonfiction books of the year. In our interview, we look at how life has changed in response to the explosion of time demands and the change in technology that we have all experienced in the last few years. In particular, we look in some detail at how the lives of women have changed in all spheres of life, including work, personal, and home. She's a brilliant author and thinker, so make sure not to miss this conversation with Bridget Schultz coming right up. Hi, and welcome back to the Two Time Labs podcast. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, today we have a very special guest, the author of Overwhelmed, Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time. And if that resonates with you any at all, you'd be happy to know that today we have Bridget Schultz, the author of that book, on our show today, coming to tell us all about the lives that we're living but not quite understanding in terms of how overwhelmed we are. Bridget, welcome to the Two Time Labs podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you, and, and it's great to be with you almost on the one-year, I guess, anniversary of your book. Right, yes. It came out in March of 2014, and the paperback is coming out this March. Oh, which is actually just in a, in a couple couple of days' time. I'm interviewing you a few days ahead of the, the date, but this will actually come out right after. Awesome. So you've been only out on, on hard copy and, I guess, on Audible? So yes, hard copy and, and Audible, and then the paperback is out March 3rd. Great. And you know, your, your, your book is so, so timely and it's resonated with so many because it addresses the worldwide global phenomena of overwhelm. And it, in particular, how we are struggling with it in the, the home and in the workplace and in all facets of our lives. And um, I, I read an article that you wrote and I wanted to see if we could lead with that. An article for the Washington Post. Unfortunately, I didn't write down the actual title of it, but it talked about how we are giving up our vacations to spend time at work. Can you tell us a little bit about what you, what your research uncovered and what the impact is on our life? Well, I began looking at time, time at work, time at home, and time off, if you will, and leisure time for my book. And since I've been uh, back at the Washington Post, where I've been a reporter for many years, I've really continued to explore these themes that I, that I was researching in the book. And it's, it's, on the one hand, it's shocking, and then on the other hand, it really isn't. Um, the United States is alone among all industrial or advanced economies that ha- it has no paid vacation policy, zero days, you know, uh, that law or policy allow. Um, that's compared to other countries where they are, you know, there might be 10 days, say in Japan, 20 or 30 days in Europe. Um, and those are, um, those are sort of policies that were developed long ago. And in the United States, back in the 1930s, there was an effort to have a two-week paid vacation that was part of our Fair Labor Standards Act. And that got dropped back in the 1930s, and it's never been picked up since. So what we've got now is uh, one in four workers in the United States has no paid vacation at all. And they tend to be low-income workers or hourly workers. And the people who do get vacation, it's all at the discretion of their employer, their private employer. Uh, and they have about 10 or 14 days on average, so no more than two weeks. And this is the crazy thing. 
survey after survey after survey shows that a majority of Americans work during vacation. And, That's right. and so this most recent study that I wrote about, it was a RAND, some economists at RAND wrote, uh, did a study of about 3,000 Americans. And what they, and they were asking people about, you know, who they were and how they identified politically. And, uh, what they discovered is that Republicans were more likely to work on vacation than Democrats or independents. Mm-hmm that men were more likely to work on vacation than women, uh, and that college-educated were something like 77% more likely to work on vacation than those who did not have a college education. Now, that's not all that surprising because the kind of work that you do that you can take with you, uh, it tends to be kind of knowledge work or office work. So right. it's that same sense of always being on, that you can never get away from your technology. And I tell you, when I've interviewed people and talked with them, I can't tell you how many say, oh, I have to check email on vacation because I dread <laughs> coming back to it. And so, I mean, <laughs> right. it's, it's like technology is this wonderful tool, and yet at the same time, it's taken over our lives. We, it's like we're still learning how to have it at work for us instead of against us. I think we're, uh, you know, we're just in a real era of flux with technology, with change, with gender roles, with the economy, with the types of jobs we do. We're just in a, a, a real massive period of, of change and flux. Right. People used to come here to Jamaica on vacation thinking that, oh, I'll get away from it all. But of course, no, we have Wi-Fi everywhere. Every hotel has Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. And there's data plans that you can roam on easily. And there, we have a 99.9% coverage. And we actually have higher higher mobile penetration here in Jamaica than even the U.S. It's like 130% or something. Wow. Well, I, I tell you, I was in... No escape. I know. I was in, I was in Jamaica in May. It was it's beautiful. It's the second time there. Just love it. There's a favorite place that we like to go outside of Negril. And it was a, a friend of ours. It was their 30th wedding anniversary. They've been going for years. And it's always been sort of this getaway, complete time out of time. And yet, there there were a number of people sitting there with their laptops doing work. And it just felt, on the one hand, if they if they really feel like they can't get away from work, well, then that's great to be able to do your work in such a beautiful place. But on the other hand, really, <laughs> really shut it down, really? <laughs> jump in the ocean, you know, be where you are. So it's it's amazing that we we have this. You know, the sense that if if we're not always on our technology or always working, that we're going to miss something or that we're missing out. Or uh, and, and when you look at the research for why that is, there's a real uh, neurological reason for that. The technology, it works on the same reward systems in our brains that addiction does. So it's, it, it, there's this craving that, that you, you almost can't help unless you're aware of it and unless you create boundaries and systems to understand that you're going to be craving it and so so to kind of create boundaries around it. Now, I say that, and I'm going to be the first one to admit I'm still working on that. It, you know, I, I'm not – I'm very much a work in progress. These are really – these are very tough and very new kind of uh, issues that we're all dealing with. Right, right. And do you have a sense that, in, from your research, that the U.S. didn't put in place – the um, policies or laws to govern employee leave was that because of deliberate choice of political expediency or we just overlooked it or oh yeah we just didn't get around to it this time around but next time we will what's your sense of of why the u.s has developed so differently from most other parts of the world well it started out politically um <laughs> like a lot of things uh, you know, there was a, earlier on in the uh, early 20th century, uh, you know, it was, it was really interesting. There were some calls for as much as two to three months of paid vacation, uh, and those sort of didn't go anywhere. But in the 1930s, uh, there was this Fair Labor Standards Act, and this was the sort of the culmination of uh, union power, if you will, or um, workers kind of banding together and saying, we want to work, but we want to be, we want to do good work and we want to have reasonable conditions. We want to have good wages. Um, you know, we want our bread and our roses too. We want to work hard, be able to afford our lives and enjoy them as well. Um, the big union songs at the time were, we fight for bread, but we fight for roses too. And so mm-hmm. at the time, there were 
uh, proposals to do three things, and one was to increase the minimum wage, another was to limit the work week to 40 hours. And at the time, you have to remember, if you worked in a steel mill, your typical shift was, it could be 10 to 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week. I mean, the weekend is a very new phenomenon. People forget it was unions who brought you the weekend, oh, yeah. and you have Catholics and Jews to thank for that, because the Jewish Sabbath was Saturday, and a Catholic and Christian, I should say Christians, not Catholics, but Christian and Catholic uh, Sabbath is Sunday. And mm -hmm. so uh, that was part of, well, you can't favor one work or over another. And so the weekend was really created out of deference to people's uh, deep-seated need to have religious expression. So, uh, the, so the weekend was Saturday and Sunday was created, uh, um, you know, right about in the same era. And uh, so at the same time, there was also a proposal for a two-week paid vacation. And when it came to time for negotiations, the business community went, all right, we'll give you the 40-hour work week, mainly because Henry Ford, the auto, man auto manufacturer who, you know, had several faults of his own, uh, mm -hmm. but he had a vision that, uh, well, based on his own internal research, he brought workers in, or not, he brought um, researchers in to, to figure out how efficient uh, a worker could be on his uh, uh, assembly line. How could he get the most productivity out of them? And it was through those studies that he discovered it was 40 hours. You could work a manual laborer about 40 hours, and then they started getting sick, stupid, tired. They would make mistakes. They'd get resentful. They'd slow down their work. And so he capped the work. The, the shift at eight hours, and that, the business community went crazy at the time, and he closed his factory on Saturdays. And his vision was, I'm making this product, this automobile, and I need to make it inexpensive so a lot of people can buy it, so my workers need to have good wages, and then uh, uh, and they need to be able to afford this machine, and then I need to give them time to use it and have leisure time. So he he had this vision that it, for you to be able to use this mod, Model T, this uh, car, you needed money and time. And so uh, so he was really a, a big force in raising the minimum wage, cutting the work week. Uh, and so then when it came down time to uh, kind of embody these in national in national law and national policy, the business community said, all right, we'll give you minimum wage. Okay, we'll give you a um, 40-hour work week, but forget it. We're not going to give you vacation. And it died there, and uh, it's never really been brought up again. Mm -hmm. There are some states, I will say Washington State is, has, a, this is the second se uh, legislative session. They've introduced a paid vacation bill. But it didn't go anywhere last uh, last session, and um, and the climate is such in the United States. We tend to really value not just hard work, but overwork and working all the time. Uh, I just was I'm writing a story right now on startup culture. You know, where you sleep under your desk and you work 130 hours a week, and uh, regardless of whether it gets you really good product or not, there is this sort of almost machismo culture that you have to work all the time to be considered a good worker. And clearly the data shows that's not true, and yet we believe it as if it's almost like religious gospel. Well, there certainly isn't a, a, a Henry Ford, an equivalent of a, a CEO, who is standing up to say, hold on a minute, what are we doing? There's, there's not even a, for example, there's not even a, a smartphone maker that I know of who's saying, oh my God, people are using these uh, devices inappropriately and they're texting and driving and we should do something about it and they're endangering themselves and they're trying to be more productive by engaging in habits like that, but it's not more productive, so why don't we try and do something about it? Let's try to discourage. They, they, there, there hasn't been any discouragement from Apple, Samsung, Google, any of the device makers or, or <laughs> well, software makers who are <laughs> quite the opposite, right? Well, the device makers <laughs> now want you to be able to check your email on your watch. They want to have Google Glasses so you can check the Internet as you walk down the street. So, they, you know, I think people want to implant chips in their bodies. So they're going, they're going like all tech all the time. But on the other hand, I will say that there, there are some... Uh, leaders, there are some industries that uh, that are, are looking at 
uh, I, I, Gallup, uh, the Gallup poll has done for years, has tracked worker burnout and worker disengagement to, as a way to kind of figure out, uh, worker productivity. And uh, disengagement is really high. Something like uh, three fourths of the, right. of the workers that they, um, that they survey say that they feel disengaged from work. A number of them feel burnt out and overwhelmed. And so you're not going to get really innovative work or the best work out of people when they're kind of slogging through their days and just trying to get to the end of their email inbox. So there are, I would say, in, in the more kind of quote-unquote knowledge industries or the quote-unquote talent industries like the financial services sector uh, where they, you know, where there is sort of this race for talent, um, you know, where you can sort of write your own ticket in a sense if you have the education and if you have the, the skills where they're recognizing, particularly millennials, don't want to work the way that baby boomers did. Uh, and so you see places like PricewaterhouseCoopers and Ernst, uh, Ernst and Young and other places putting in uh, parental leave policies for men and women. Um, you see them... Is that worldwide or is that... Just, yeah, that's, the that's... Select offices worldwide. worldwide. That's, a, that's a policy. Um, awesome. Uh, you have the, the head of PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, talking very openly about how he left a meeting, a very important meeting in China, and explained that he promised his teenage daughter that he would be there when she took her driving test. And leaving this, you know, quote-unquote, very important meeting to go to another very important meeting in another uh, you know, part of his life and his home life. And so you have a much more open discussion about how people are their authentic selves, which is you work, but that's not your own only identity. You also have a life outside of work. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how, how we could have gotten this far? Because we're, we're, it's now 2015, and, and, and in the U.S. and many other countries, there's not been much progress made in, in, in anything, if anything, that the new gadgets and the new, um, the new technology has helped us to develop bad habits more quickly and, and, be, and, and they're no more acceptable. So I could be talking with you here uh, on our podcast and I could be, you know, checking my Facebook account. <laughs> People think that's, o that's okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the new okay. It's, it's okay to be talking to people. On, in an important situation, and it's okay to be on on your smartphone doing something else at the same time. How do you have any sense of how we got to this point? I mean, forget the etiquette and the the cause that's that's bad enough, and the other factors. But how did we get to this point where our productivity is so damaged by anyone's measure? Because if you ask anyone who's a thinking person, they would say, you know, it's probably not good that we're all doing this. Right. So they would all agree. But how do we get to this? Why does it take laws, for example, to reverse texting while driving? What, didn't it become obvious to us sort of long before that, wow, you know, I really could be putting my life at risk. Yeah. This is probably not a good idea. What is it that has us override blatant common sense and even our own self-interest? Well, is it that, are we anxious? Are we, does the protest not work ethic? Do we just want money? What's your sense? Well, I think it goes back to what what I was saying earlier that that really uh, neuroscience is really behind this. That our uh, the the technology, every kind of ding and flash, every tweet, every notification. Oh, you have a new request for a friend on Facebook. Oh my goodness, there's a, somebody's tweeting about you. Uh, every time that that, that that lights up, yeah, it's sort of. It's this. Uh, it's kind of like this anticipation system. It lights up the the same areas in your brain that light up in addiction, and you get this dopamine rush, which is sort of the pleasure hormone, and your body floods with this. Oh, this is so exciting! It's like a treat. It's like a gift. Uh, it's like junk food. I can't wait. Oh my goodness, it's going to be so delicious, and you cannot help yourself. And then, and then you know you'll check the Facebook, and then sometimes it's disappointing. Sometimes it's, it's exciting. More times, uh, more often than not, it's disappointing. It's like oh. Very Variable reinforcement. Oh, right, but then, but then you you kind of have that hope that next time it's going to be cool. It's like maybe one in ten times it's cool, um, but it really sets off that kind of craving cycle. So in a sense, we're texting while we're driving or emailing because we're not in our right minds. Our rational mind has not is not driving the the, the car or our behavior, so to speak. We're letting our cravings and this addiction behavior take over. It's very seductive. These these devices are very seductive. 
And again, they're so new that we haven't really adapted to figure out how to use them and to use them wisely because I will tell you right now, there's really great research that shows that you cannot pay attention to two important things at the same time with any kind of success. You, I mean, you can, but you're going to be, it's going to be kind of uh, half attention and a little mediocre. So you cannot do two tasks at the same time that require thinking and attention. You really can. Your brain, and I, I know that there's sort of co a common uh, mythology out there that women are able to do it and they're able to multitask, and that's not true. Um, you know, there, there's a piece of the brain that uh, between the, the two hemispheres of the brain that's a little thicker in women, and so people think, oh, they're able to make these connections faster. That's not true. There's been really great neuroscience that shows there's more variation within gender than there is across gender. So women are not wired to multitask. Nobody's wired to multitask. You really can pay attention to only one thing at a time. I would think that, that or back to texting and driving, that in spite of the, the, the sweet dopamine rush and the, the possible Facebook updates <laughs> and who might it be coming from, I would think that my fear of dying would be slightly higher. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. I know. I know. It's like really bad news. <laughs> I, you know, I know. And, uh, and again, that's because our rational, our rational mind, where we would be able to, to weigh, you know, do I really need to answer this at this moment? Can I wait three minutes until I get to my house or my office? That rational thinking part of our brain is, is really shut down. Uh, you know, it's the same with addiction. Uh, you know, how many people don't want to take that drink, don't want to take the next hit, don't really want to do it, but they can't help themselves. So we almost have to look at technology, not quite the same, but in a similar fashion, which means we have to be aware that there is craving. We have to be aware that it's seductive. And so you can kind of disrupt that cycle. You can just sort of feel your fingers itch, like at the stoplight. Oh, I want to grab that phone. You have to understand, okay, that's just the dopamine rush. Maybe do something like take a deep breath. Decide you can wait, but, but kind of bring that awareness to that, that craving and then make a different decision in the moment. And then the more you do it, the more you'll, you'll build up your willpower, the more you'll become, it, it will become a new habit, a new practice. It's just going to take time and practice. Given, given our weakness, should there be a... I'm actually looking at a box right here of my new. I just got a brand new smartphone. Yeah. And should there be a, 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 a some printing on the side, like a, a warning, a warning label that says, "Warning: This device may alter your brain chemistry and cause you to do stupid things." <laughs> are we, you know, are we going to 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 that level of? If not warning, at least education. Well, I guess uh, you know. What good would that warning do when you're sitting at the stoplight? You know, you're far away from your packaging at that point. That's but true. I do think that education... Like a cigarette. Yeah, I do think that education is very important. Being aware, understanding how it works on our brain systems. And I think that there is really good research that's emerging that shows us that. And and that's why, as a, as a writer, that's one of the things that I try to write about to help to help get the word out there, to help make sure that we're all educated and continue to be educated so we can make smarter decisions to live our lives better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it does seem as if the, the combination of technology, more work, the recession, uh, wanting to hold on to our jobs has sort of created the perfect storm for us. Well, the recession certainly has taken all of the trends that were you know, already in motion. And, you know, we haven't even talked about gender roles. Gender roles. Right. It's the first time in human history that, uh, or uh, I, I, let me rephrase this, the first time since maybe the Pleistocene era or, uh, you know, <laughs> some point way, way, way back that we've really had a, a uh, a real reimagining of, of gender roles, and that's it's it's incredibly confusing. Um, there's a lot of kind of old scripts or old movies that play in our heads, and then our, our lives don't really line up with it. And so there's a lot of kind of interior jangling that's going on. Um, we're still trying to negotiate our relationships with our with each other. You're right. Work has become work itself has changed. Um, uh, work has become much more demanding, um, you know, with globalization. There's uh, nobody really quite knows what the future is going to hold. 
Um, jobs are not as secure as they used to be. There's a rise of contract, temporary, and contingent workers. So the old, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the old compact, if you will, between employer and employee, where you had strong unions and you had good benefits and you had a pension and, you know, your, your employer wanted good work from you, but they were going to take care of you. And then you, mm -hmm. the employee wanted to do good work, but then you were also loyal and you'd reward them with really good work. Those are all broken. And I think what you see mm -hmm. is this... Uh, I think that's a big piece of this increasing income inequality that we see. Uh, workers are, uh, it's all, you know, every man and woman for himself. There really isn't this kind of uh, collective sense of, of um, union power is at the lowest. It's been in like 100 years, it's, which is mm -hmm. amazing. It's, of all private employers, only 6% are in unions. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people think they're anachronistic. You know, tech companies, entrepreneurs, they tend to be more libertarian. And that's all fine. It's all well and good if you're making uh, a good wage and you can have some uh, measure of predictability and stability. Uh, but that's just not the case for many people. Mm -hmm. what, why hasn't the circle sort of closed? Why, why haven't... Why hasn't CEOs and managing directors of companies, so they have a self-interest, clearly, and, or they have an interest in the company doing well. There is emerging data and more evidence that at least some behaviors are dangerous, some are unproductive, some are unhygienic, some are just plain rude. You know, there's all sorts of evidence emerging. Why haven't CEOs, for example, in, in, uh, in, in noticing what's happening, the people, for example, someone who works uh, during their entire vacation or doesn't take one at all is obviously someone who is not going to be the best knowledge worker. In, in, they're not doing the best knowledge work possible. Why haven't CEOs observed the same facts, put them together, and said, "Aha, we need to do things differently." Why aren't more Why aren't more of them doing following the Henry Ford example and just assembling? Because it, it it seems so obvious based on how you put it in your book. It the, the data is there. The, the adverse impact it's having, especially on women, is, is clear. But why hasn't common sense reached the executive suite? The executive suite are the ones that are working all those crazy hours. You know? <laughs> is it because they're, 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 they're used to it? They're, <laughs> they're like, well, they're the, well, join the club, buddy. <laughs> they're the ones that are setting the tone. Now, I will say there is, there is something to be said about being passionate about what you do, loving what you do, being interested in it, and, and so you get wrapped up in it. So, I, you know, I'm not one to ever say, and listen, I believe me, I, I call myself a recovering workaholic. I work too much, too. I'm working on it as well. So there is something to be said that when you get lost in your job, when you love it, when you want to spend the hours, and you're excited about it. So nobody wants to tamp down on that passion. But then what ends up happening, and a lot of times with CEOs, you know, let's face it, we look at the statistics, the vast majority are men. So I think you have something like 4 or 5% who are women and Fortune 500 companies in the United States. Uh, and it's not that much different in the rest of the world. So the vast majority are men. The vast majority have all of the stuff at home, their kids, their house, everything, uh, everything that needs to happen in life is taken care of by somebody else. Either they pay for it or they have a wife that does it all. Uh, you know, that is just not the case for the majority of workers. And so what you have is you've got CEOs who are able to work those kinds of hours, who are uh, willing and able, and they think everybody else should, or they'll say, no, you really shouldn't, but then by their, by their example show that that's what they value. And so then everybody else feels like, well, the boss is here till 11. I have to be here till 11. Ooh, the boss sent me an email at 3 in the morning. I have to send an email at 3 in the morning. In Japan, they actually they have a word for it. They call it furoshiki. They call it cloaked overtime, that you have to stay there until your boss leaves. <laughs> the boss doesn't leave. Oh, my God. So, killing yourself. That, right. And so, so when you ask about why haven't CEOs recognized this, the CEOs are a, are a big part of the problem, frankly. And there's mm -hmm. no, you know, there was a, there was a, a, a study done uh, by a consulting company. They asked CEOs and managers of, of big companies all around, the, all around the globe, really, and said, who do you think is the best worker? And three-fourths of them said, somebody with no caregiving responsibilities. Well, Whoa. well, who is that? Who is that anymore? That's some guy who lived in the 1950s, or that's a CEO. 
the vast majority of people, men and women, have caregiving responsibilities, whether it's your kids or whether it's your aging parents. Uh, you know, so, so we have... I mean, direct, direct caregiving, like you're the one who actually, you, don't, you haven't delegated it to a, a, a maid or a nanny. You're the one who does it. Well, when I say caregiving, you know, yeah, just because you've got a maid or a nanny or you've hired somebody like a home health care worker, you're still it. You're still in charge of okay. it. You're still mm-hmm, responsible mm-hmm. for it. Um, mm-hmm. You're doing some of it. You're certainly responsible for it. You're organizing it. You're arranging it. That takes a lot of mental energy as well as physical mm-hmm. energy. And so what we've got, that's another just really big, gigantic disconnect going on between what we expect, what we think are the best workers, and what we're really able to do. We're expected right. to work as if we didn't have families and then have families as if we didn't work. Because at right. the, same the perfect, the ideal employee, like you said, the ideal work. Right, and at the same time, the standards for what we expect to be a good parent, even to be, a, you know, a good uh, adult child of a, uh, you know, of an aging parent, they've really never been higher. So what we've got are really impossible uh, expectations that we've put on, on people, um, and that's a lot of why I wrote the book to try to bring them to light, to get right. to to begin these conversations, to say, look, people, this is unsustainable. <laughs> And it's not good for anybody. It's not even good for those CEOs because there's plenty of good data that shows you can work, uh, you know, you can probably push your stuff and work 60 plus hours a week for maybe a few weeks. But after that, you really are burned out. Uh, right. that, that your brain, it gets its best ideas in the shower for a reason. That if you want to talk about wiring, we are neurologically wired for the inspiration, the aha moment to come. Not when you have your nose to the grindstone, but when you're in a moment of idleness. They, right. you know, it's called the default mode network. It, it lights up when you're idle, when you're not paying attention to something, when maybe you're on a walk or you're daydreaming or you're standing in line at the grocery store. So don't put the phone out all of a sudden because those might be the precious moments that insight might arrive. Right. Interestingly, uh, some data came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, here in Jamaica, we actually have the number one. No, no one knew this, by the way. This came as a as a surprise to us, also. But we have the number one, number one ratio, the highest ratio of female to male managers. It's actually sixty two percent of our managers are female. Oh, wow! It's so it, it so we're still we're still in. We, we we knew it was high, but we didn't know it was that high. Mm-hmm. Wow! Um, it's number one in the entire world. Wow. It would be an interesting sort of study. But part of it, is, of course, is also it, there's a cultural difference. Our rating in terms of um, the World Economic Forum, in terms of our productivity, is the U.S. is number three or four, and we're in the high 80s. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. overall, our productivity is much, much lower. But there is a certain consideration that I've noticed in working around our companies Um there are so many women in in positions or influence influential positions, not in the boards yet, but they're at the CEO and executive suite and managerial levels. There is a consideration, a kind of an understanding that you do need to take care of your family and and working on vacation is seen as um, it is I would say it's it's an extreme. Mm-hmm. Not taking your vacation, some some do that. So there is some of that. But I think it would be really worth, interesting comparing the two to see what the impact is of having a workplace where you have, where most of the women, most of the managers are women as opposed to minorities. It's, it's, it just struck me that that's a, it's a factoid that we're, really hasn't been studied by, by, by us in Jamaica too much. I love and it. We don't, know the, we don't know the meaning that's of it, to be honest. That's interesting. Well, maybe I, maybe I should come down and investigate. <laughs> I think you need a six month. <laughs> November till <laughs> May. Yeah, yeah. Bring my kids. It sounds <laughs> exactly. great. Exactly. Nice long sabbatical that you actually study it at, le- at your leisure. Yeah, bring my kids <laughs> on screen. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. I will say I did travel to Denmark for when I was researching the book, largely because I, again I was looking at leisure time and what's happened to our leisure time. And obviously, when we work all the time, and then every time minute that we're not at work, we're like busy running around on either on our technology or parents are running around with their kids taking them to cello lessons and soccer and this and that 
really kind of asking, you know, what is leisure and what happened to it and, and why is it important and, or, you know, should we try to get it back? And I was looking at time use research and saw that in Denmark, they have among the most leisure of, of any kind of a Western country, certainly. And men and women have very similar amounts of leisure, which is weird because in most countries, men have a lot more leisure than women because women are still, you know, they're working in the marketplace more and more, but they're, they're doing a lot of the child care and housework. They're still doing a lot more than men are. Uh, and so I, I, the other thing that was really striking is that in Denmark, women there had the most what they call pure leisure time or time to yourself. Whereas in most countries, women tend to think that's very selfish, that leisure time should, mm. should be spent with and for other people, organizing things, making sure everybody else is having a good time. A lot of times if you ask a woman, what would you, what would you like to do in her free time? She doesn't know because she's so used to kind of accommodating other people. So I went to Denmark right. to say, wow, what are they doing there? What is so different that men and women have so much leisure time? And the kids are happy, you know, the, and, and Denmark is always rated as one of the most happy, uh, that one of the happiest countries in the world. So I went, and I, it's, a couple things struck me, and when, we, when we're talking about work, what really struck me is, is they are, they work very, uh, I don't want to say short, but they work very intense hours. But when they are done, they are done. And, ah. and what was interesting is, uh, when I, when I talked with a number of people there, they just said, um, there was an American I spent time with, and she was explaining to me that she worked like an American over there. So she'd come in early, she'd be the first in the door, and she'd stay late, she'd eat through lunch, and she would end up staying so late that the only place that was open to get something to eat was a gas station, you know? So she was oh. putting in all these hours, and then her time came for her performance review, and she didn't get a very good performance evaluation. And so she went to her bosses and said, well, why? I'm working so hard for you. And they said, that's just it. You're working so hard that you don't have a life. And having work-life balance is the, like one of the top three things that we value here. Because if you, oh, my God. Because if you have that sense of well-being, if you are happy, you're going to do better work. And then oh you're going to be more productive. And so she said it was a real lesson to her that, you know, working the American way uh, not only wasn't valued culturally, but also wasn't valued in a business sense. And what's interesting is when I've talked to when I talked to other Danes, they said their view is if you're working late, it's not like wow you're so great. It's like wow, what's your problem? Why can't you get your work done? You know? Do they see that as a as a personal problem? They do. Or do they see that as a or would they see it as a you're neglecting your family kind of problem? Well, because the way that because here in here here in Jamaica and in and in the U.S. One thing that we do have in common is that the, the 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 wife or the mother is the one who takes care of the kids. That 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 is that is still true for both of both of our cultures. That the 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 extra work that everyone is required to do has fallen unevenly on the the, the shoulders of the mother, which is the point that your book makes, right? Right. But are the Danes do they see that as a, a that the overtime is spent as taking time away from yourself or also from others who are you should be spending it with well I, I i will say this is the the other interesting thing that uh they have really made a uh intentional effort to make sure that that burden if you will uh or at at home with housework mm -hmm. and child care falls more evenly on men and women you know just like we talk about you know, Cheryl Sandberg talks about women leaning into the work, you know, the workplace. It's like, well, that's not going to happen unless men can lean out because somebody's got to take care of the kids because nobody wants to warehouse them somewhere. Nobody would want to do that. And so, um, I think what's, True. what's really interesting is that in Denmark, they have a cabinet level minister of gender equality. We have the really? same level of importance as uh, the secretary of state and minister of, uh, of defense. They take it so seriously that um, both boys and girls, when they're 14, they both take home ac so that they both learn how to cook. Um, wow! They have. Uh, and do men do men get maternity leave as well? Men get they get they get uh, they call it parental leave. Parental leave. And what's mm -hmm. really interesting, they don't do this in Denmark anymore, but that in other Scandinavian countries that started very early with very generous maternity leave policies. They wanted to try to, they thought they were going to help mothers work. And so they gave them long leaves, sometimes as, as much as three years. 
Um, they gave them paid leave. They gave them ability to work part-time or flexible work. And then what they ended up finding is that women, um, employers didn't want to hire women because they thought, oh, why would I hire her? And she's going to be gone for three years. And then if she has another baby, she's going to be gone for another three years. And so women tended to be kind of uh, shuffle, shunted off into public sector jobs, um, you know, lower paying jobs or part time jobs. So they had what they call occupational segregation. And uh, we actually in the United States, even though we don't have any of those generous policies, we have more, full, you know, more full time working mothers, more in the private sector, more on higher levels. And so they began looking at, well, how do we change that? And so they figured we got to help men lean out, if you will. And so they devised these parental leave oh. policies. They wanted they wanted to see, well, can we get men to take parental leave? So they changed their policies and they gave men more money while they didn't take leave. They gave them more time. Men didn't take leave. And then I think they read human behavioral economics and they said, mm -hmm. okay, we'll make this use it or lose it. And so if you will give mothers a certain allotted time and will give fathers a certain allotted time, and if fathers don't use it, then the family loses it. Man, the family, the loses, family it. loses it. And so men started oh taking... God. Men started taking parental leave, solo parental leave, uh, like the typically like in Iceland. Moms will get three months, then dads will get three months, and then the family has three months to share. And so, what they found is that three years after this lose it or use it policy came in, when the child is three years old, before before the policy, mothers were still doing a majority of the of the child care. But now that fathers are involved early on from the start and by themselves. 70% of the couples are equally sharing child care by the time that child is three. So that's a huge, huge, a shift. huge shift. And that's really exciting because I think the other thing that you're seeing, uh, and that I started, and I do have a chapter of this in my book, it's not just moms. You've got dads who want to be involved, who want to be more than just a paycheck. They don't want the kind of distant role that their fathers had. And they're beginning to feel just as overwhelmed or in some, by some measures, more overwhelmed than mothers because they're expected to be these, you know, ideal workers at work putting in all these hours. And so they're beginning to do what women did 30 years ago. They're giving up sleep, time for personal care, and spending all their leisure time with their kids and getting really burned out. So this is really, uh, it, it's a really interesting and pivotal time in our, our human culture. Mm. It's, it, it occurs to me that there's, two arenas that are, we've talked about two arenas. One is the public policy arena, where governments are, like the one in Denmark, are seeing the light and then making policy, legal, law, legal ch changes in the laws so that people's behavior changes. And the other is at the company level, where there's a handful of CEOs and a handful of companies that are, are, are also waking up to the fact that a more productive worker is one that has a balanced life. Like the example that you gave of your friend, uh, any idea of which, in the U.S. at least, might sort of kick in first, uh. the company or or the or the or maybe maybe the federal government or the state government. Well, I think that we have a very different uh, political structure here in the United States than than in Europe. You know, mm. um, it's it has a very strong libertarian streak. There is this, this kind of mythology that we are individualists and we can do everything by ourselves without recognizing that there's long been a history of, um, you know, either government help or communal work together. Um, and, and specifically in the last few decades, there's been much more of a every man and woman for, for him or herself, you know, a, a kind of a loss of the, of the sense of the common wheel, you know, um, the mm -hmm. communal good. I think mm -hmm. that there's a lot of reasons for that. There's immigration, there's fear of difference, there's racism, um, you know, there's growing in, uh, income inequality. There's a growing economic insecurity uh, that, because wages have been stagnating. Uh, you know, the 1% is getting um, so much of, of whatever wealth is created, and uh, even the middle class are feeling very precarious, and that tends to kind of narrow your vision, and you begin to, like, really try to grasp onto what just you have. But, you know, when it comes to, like, how do you make things better for everybody, for all, you know, working families, working people, um, you know, President Obama did mention it in his State of the Union address, paid, right. you know, paid sick day, something as, as you know, uh, 
as, as com- sort of mundane as mundane that. Mundane and common sense as that. There is this sense conservatives would rather have this be voluntary done through companies, and many companies do. There are lots of, of great companies out there, but many don't. And so then you have a very uneven experience out there. And that does, that does bring the question in, well, that is when you need to start talking about public policy then. But there's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there's a new Republican Congress. Uh, these policies do cost money. Uh, what would be the government role? There's a, uh, a, a very strong conservative streak in the United States that wants very limited or no government at all. It, you know, we still have these very basic disagreements about what we think government should be and do. So given that, and given the state of dysfunction of, of politics in Washington, you are seeing very interesting things happen at the state level. You've got three states now, uh, California, Rhode Island, uh, and New Jersey that do have paid parental leave. Um, and you've got more, uh, you've got some states, you've got many cities that have passed paid sick days. So you've kind of got this burbling grassroots movement happening, uh, and that's really where the action is right now. And there might be interesting things happening, and uh, we'll just we'll just have to see. Well, is there any state that offers or that requires paid sick leave? Uh, yes, yeah, Connecticut and um, okay. and Massachusetts just passed it this past. Um, uh, uh, just this past November at, in the midterm election. And I think what's interesting about that is that there are several places where paid sick days passed that also sent a Republican to Congress. So you have, you know, paid sick days are, were always seen as sort of progressive or democratic. And so you've got voters voting two different ways because close to home, there's this understanding that, you know, wow, if I work at a restaurant and I'm sick, <laughs> you know, right. I don't want to be sneezing in the salad bar, but at the same time, mm. you know, uh, you know, at the same time, I don't want that worker then to not be able to pay their rent and then end up losing their job and then going on public assistance and, you know, in this downward spiral. So I think there's this recognition that we can be, we can think of the common wheel again. Uh, you know, what is the common good for, for all people? And when all people are well and, and, and doing well, um, the society is strengthened. I'm, I'm surprised that there's not more, more executives who are sort of taking the, notwithstanding what you said, which is true, which is that they, their lives are very unbalanced on average. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that there's not more of them who are, are putting in place these, or at least aspiring to these policies. They might say, you know, I can't afford it now, but I'm, I wish I could, and I really want to, and I have a five-year plan in which I'm, and I wish I want the government to give me some tax breaks so that I can put it in and it not ruin my business. But there's not more of that because you, 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 like you said, you, you don't, you don't want a sick worker coming into work because they have to, and because you don't offer sick leave, and therefore making everybody else sick. Just common sense tells you that that's. A really bad idea. Well, you know, you, and you do have companies that do have many of these progressive policies. You know, the the high tech mm-hmm. companies they have lots of paid sick days. They have some of the most mm-hmm. generous paid parental leave for men and women. So you've got companies that can afford it. They can also because they need talent and they want to attract talented workers. They need to have these benefits and policies. You have other workplaces. Uh, particularly, this is really a, a question of low wage workers where. A, Right. You know, a worker is a dime a dozen, and if you're sick, I can fire you, and I can get ten other people to do your low wage job. So, uh, so that's where you have to start talking about what's the good for everybody. Because I can't tell you, I I, uh, I interviewed a woman who uh, was sick on New Year's Eve and called in sick, and even though uh, the company had a the restaurant had a policy that you shouldn't work if you had a high fever, and she had high fever, and she's vomiting, she had diarrhea, she called in sick. And then uh, they told her by text not to come in again. And since it's January, she's been having a hard time finding a job, and she's about to go on, on public assistance. You know, that's, I, I can't imagine that that's really what we want our workers to experience in America. Yeah, it's hard to imagine a, a, a general manager or a CEO saying, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I did that. That was, a good, that was a good idea because it has an impact on all the other workers. Who are who, who who saw what happened to this poor this poor woman, and then there's, I, I can't imagine that they're inspired or engaged by the whole idea. They've got to be resentful, and how could that be good? Right, 
Right? Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, boy, it's it's we live in interesting times, and there's all these tremendous forces that are. It seems as if they're bigger than the individual. Is is there anything you recommend that the individual do to to sort of cope with all that's happening around us? Well, and and I did when I was working on my book. I looked very much at those two levels because there are these bigger kind of structural issues, if you will that need to be addressed, our, our cultural attitudes, our laws and our policies. But, you know, that might take, social change is hard, and it may take yeah. a while. It's not impossible. I, I certainly write about bright spots in my book, about where cool things are happening and changing. And part of why I did that is because we're humans, and we learn through narrative and story. And so part of what I want to do is show that there is other, that there there are other ways to do things, and that there are are enlightened companies and there are really interesting policies and there are different things that people are doing so that it, it won't seem so scary. Uh, you know, again, have this conversation to put things on the table to see that there are choices to be made. But at the same time, knowing that change might come a decade, two decades from now, what can I do right here, right now, today? Yeah, and so, right. uh, so I do have, I, I call it a personal mastery chapter, if you will, in the book, really looking at how do you how do you sort of fight your own way out of the overwhelm when you live in a kind of in how do you find sanity in an insane time? And you know I do have a couple things that that I would advise, and it's certainly something that I continue to work on. And the first and the most important thing is just to pause, take a moment to pause, whether that's going for a walk or just taking a breath when you hang up the phone. Find times in your day to just disrupt that kind of breathless feeling of busyness and recognize that your life is bigger than just, you know, always going, going, mm-hmm. going. Kind of mm-hmm. reco- reconnect with that that bigger sense that, that this is your one and only life and mm-hmm. what is most important to you. Take some time, figure out what are your handful of priorities. It's not going to be your to-do list. You'll always have 70 to 100 things on your to-do list. That's not your priority. If you live by the to-do list, you'll die by the to-do, to-do list, and it will never be done. You know, you'll never mm-hmm. get to the end of it. So right. what's most important to you in this moment? And they can be simple things like, you know, nurturing myself and my family, um, you know, doing excellent work, um, uh, you know, taking time to... Uh, to play and enjoy the sunset and uh, recognizing that, that play is what makes us human and that ability to imagine and to daydream, uh, those, are, those are gifts that we have that, that actually make our lives better because we often, in, in dreams, that's where we get the ideas that we can act on that then can make our lives and other people's lives better. Um, right. At work, one of the most important things that I've found is, again, setting those priorities trying to do the most important things first, and then recognizing that we have natural cycles, that we have, uh, like we sleep in 90-minute sleep cycles. We also have 90-minute uh, ultradian cycles during the day. So I try to set timers, and I'll try to figure out what's, what's my most important work, and then I turn off the phone, I turn off email, I turn off Twitter, and I really just try to focus for that 45 um, 60, 90 minute period, sometimes 30 minutes if I feel distracted, but really try to cut down on interruptions and distractions. Most workers are interrupted every three minutes and it takes you mm-hmm. about 27 minutes to get back to where you were. So to, mm-hmm. to really be able to do productive, efficient work, shut down the distractions, do that work, and your brain can do just about anything if it knows a brain, if it knows a break is coming. So then right. give yourself a break. And at best, walk around, move your body, go outside, look at something green in nature, and then come back and set your timer and 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 and, uh, and get back to some focused work. Um, right. And I think that with with gender roles, the important thing is to really be clear to just start talking about what you expect, what you hope for, what how you grew up, kind of what the movies in your head are playing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and just really start uh, setting common goals, common standards, and, and working to share the load more fairly. Right, so that there's a, a more equity. Yeah. In terms of, because if both, the, both spouses are working and working hard and working longer hours and carrying smartphones that are connected to the office, then it's, it's, it's time to renegotiate the traditional roles, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and, and too many of us are not doing that because we're sort of, 
just like anything, like with busyness, we're in this default mode. We're just kind of always busy and like, oh, well, this is the way it always has been. Oh, well, he's never going to change or she's never going to change. Mm-hmm. But you know what? If you take that time and you do pause and you make it something that you go on walks and talk about, things can change and they do change. And that's very exciting. Mm. So your book is really then a, a wake-up call to, to what's happening in our lives, in the world, with technology, and perhaps if we awaken, then we can make far better choices and live a life that's more closely aligned to our values, no? That's, that's the hope. That's the hope. I wrote it to be a game changer, and it certainly has changed my life, and it's cont- it continues to change my life as I continue to, like, <laughs> you know, learn the lessons and then forget them and learn them again. But that's just being human, and I think... One of the most hopeful things is that I've, through the bright spots in my research, um, you know, every time I kind of fall off, I get back up because I know I know other people are doing it and I know it's possible. Right. Fabulous. How can people get a hold of you and where can they buy the book? Um, well, the book will be, uh, the book's available like through all um, usual routes, Amazon, Indie Books, uh, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble. Um Powell's Bookstore. It's my favorite out in Portland, Oregon. Um, so it's available online. It should be in bookstores. The Audible, um, you know, the, the audio is also out there. If people want to reach me, I've got a website, BridgetSchulte.com. I've got an occasional newsletter that I only send out if I think is really important. I've got something really cool to tell people that will help them because I know email is, is a problem we all have. So I try not right. to send it out too often. Uh, I do have a Facebook page where there's all sorts of interesting conversations going on very informally uh, about how to live a good life. Um, and I also have email, although <laughs> I also get overloaded, so I do ask people to to be patient with me in terms of getting back to them. But I do. I answer every single one. Awesome. And, and just to remind our audience that the paperback version is coming out on March 3rd, which should be a couple of days after this particular podcast is released, we're, we're recording it before, but we're going to release it right after. And um, any idea what the cost of the paperback would be, the, the, the price, the list price? Oh, you know, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I don't know. I suppose I should. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's available. Yes. That's, that's <laughs> the, it will be available. <laughs> Right. That's the point. And there's there's updated research in it. There's a new foreword. And I think the, the important thing, that the message that I want to get across is that the book really asks two questions. Why are things the way they are? To help us all understand more how we got here. But more importantly, how can they be better? And then the journalist and me really looking at real world bright spots. There's a lot of research and data. Uh, I, there's like 70 pages of end notes. You don't have to read them, but there's a lot of really good science in there. Awesome. Well, I really want to thank you for the time that you spent with us here on the Two Time Labs podcast. It's it's one of the complaints I have is that it's tough for me to find people who have thought about topics around time-based productivity enough to be really interesting. And I'm so glad I invited you out because you so fit the bill and it's so great to have you. And I love that you've done the research and done the hard thinking, even though there's not really like this quick, easy one, two, three answer. I'm going to trust that people have gotten some tremendous value from the ideas that you share because above all else, it's the awareness and some application in their own lives that will actually make a difference. So thanks again, Bridget. Thank you so much for having me. It's been just delightful talking with you. Great. Stay tuned. There's more coming up here on the Two Time Labs podcast. Thanks for listening in to this particular episode of the Two Time Labs podcast. And I really want to thank Bridget Schultz for spending time with us uh, during this podcast to share not only from her book, but also share the fact that there's a new version of her book that's coming out, supposed to be this week, about a bookstore near you and also, of course, on Amazon.com. So once again, thanks a lot for listening. Take care and until next time, all the best.